Three of our speakers who've just spoken, that is uh, Vice Admiral Bushman, Haider Gudjonsson, and Geir to take seats. And uh, let's meet two new uh, panelists, uh, Annika Olsen, who is the mayor of Torsam in uh, the Faroe Islands, which was just mentioned by Geir, and Venka Grunbeck, who is the head of sustainable development at the CERMAC Group, which many of you will know well, a big seafood and fisheries company in Norway. And Venka has also worked with the Global Compact on Sustainable Development. So uh, a big hand to all of our panel, please. So here we are discussing uh, business in the Arctic, and uh, Gear has put it quite bluntly. He says, uh, in essence, uh, work and business are the absolute core of Arctic societies, and protection of nature means fewer people. And if we are to expand business, the implication is that there are difficult choices to be made and that you know, our uh, desire to protect uh, the pristine and wild nature of the Arctic may have to be compromised to a certain extent, that choices have to be made. Let us start with a very specific example. So let's go to the Faroe Islands and to you uh, and, and your perspective on this. What are your ambitions? for expanding the economy of the Faroe Islands. That, that's, yeah, that's what I really want to begin with, because I don't know the Faroe Islands, and I don't know quite where you sit economically and where you want to get to. Thank you. The Faroe Islands is are 18 beautiful islands located centrally in the Arctic. We are a traditional fishery nation, but still a very modern society with a booming economy. There has never been uh, more focus on the Faroe Island than right now, both from our neighbors and also from all over the world. What we emphasize more than anything is a good infrastructure, domestically and internationally. We have connected 88% of the people together with good roads, tunnels, bridges and sub-tunnels. We are currently expanding our harbour in Taoshan, and the only airport in the Faroe Islands has been extended, and we have the world's best internet and the fastest. The Faroe Islands uh, are the natural port and hub into the Arctic and to the Northern Sea Route. We can see that there is a growth in shipping traffic, uh, and it will increase in the future. This will open new opportunity for the new harbour in Toshan that we are building at the moment, so we can be a good service centre for maritime services and vessel services. Can I just uh, stop? I just would love a figure. Gear suggested that, I mean, if you are included in the Arctic communities, as he says, you know, you should be, uh, you're the one area that is actually expanding its population. So what, what are you, where was your population, say, 10 years ago, and where is it now, and where do you anticipate it's going to go? I think that um, one of uh, the reasons is that we are a very open society. Um, we have a lot of business in the Faroe Island. Uh, for example, um, the company... Just give me a sense of the numbers, because I, I genuinely have... Yeah, uh, for example, uh, the salmon uh, company, Bakafrost, is mm. one of the largest uh, enterprise in the Faroe Islands, and among uh, the five largest uh, enterprises in the whole world, uh, for taking one example. And I think uh, the key issue is that we have a very good infrastructure. That is the key... Uh, uh, answer to that. Um, but also education and entrepreneurship is very important as well. We have established a new innovation house in Toshan where businesses and the University of the Faroe Islands are gathered and working together. Uh, tourism is increasing at the moment uh, and we have a very sustainable view at uh, tourism. Uh, for example, uh, last year we had this uh, close for maintenance campaign where 100 volunteers from all over the world came to the Faroe Island and helped us with uh, uh, roads and so on, so you could uh, yeah, have this connection between the tourists and the local people. So we think it's very important that the local people get benefits of, uh, of the tourism uh, growth. Uh, one other goal for us is that in 2030 we will be 100% renewable with uh, green energy when we are speaking of electricity. So the Faroe Island will be in the future a green valley, a green country in the Arctic. Mm. Okay. Uh, 
that's the perspective then from a mayor, and I know that mayors in, in the Arctic are keen to work together mm. to progress the sort of the, the growth of their communities. Uh, so we can might talk about that a little more later, but let's then switch from a, a mayor to uh, a business executive, but you obviously have made a point of focusing very much in your role in CERMAC on, on sustainable growth of the business. We've talked a lot about the, the responsibilities that sit upon government. We've talked a lot about the interface between science and government. What about business? You know, to what extent can we look to Arctic-based businesses to truly develop a sustainable growth model? Um, so first of all, I think we all uh, can agree that business has to share responsibility alongside with government and civil society in, in driving change towards a green or blue economy or green, green transition. Um, and there are many reasons for this. Uh, it's the social license to operate, of course, uh, that drives business. Uh, you need to work with local communities uh, in the Arctic and elsewhere uh, to develop a sustainable business. Um, but it's also um, the impact of the bottom line. Um, there's no seafood industry in a dead ocean. So sustainability and, and, uh, and, um, and business development and goes hand in hand for, for a company like CERMAC. Um, we have three pillars that we've been working on for several years, um, which is transparency, partnership, and performance. And we see that the first two, transparency and partnerships, really drives performance as well. Uh, and we have several levels of these partnerships. Um, and one of the aims is, of course, what the US Coast Guard here mentioned, uh, prevention. Uh, you don't want... Uh, you don't want to wait for regulations uh, to do something on climate change as a business, but you don't want to wait for a major incident either to drive regulations uh, and, and spur action. So that's what we're doing in the Global Compact in the UN, uh, working with uh, different uh, stakeholders, working with governments and within the ocean industries in particular, which is why my role. Uh, to develop common solutions, common uh, see where there are common technology solutions that we can apply across the industries. Mm. Just seems to me, uh, as business seeks to open up the Arctic ever more, the, the, you know, the, the temptation is to push the envelope. And I, I just want to come back to you, if I may, uh, Admiral, on, on this notion of prevention. You know, as, as shipping seeks to explore new routes and to expand its its reach, and as tourism also, and, and I guess the, the, the mm. fishing industry sure. too, they seek to push further. Uh, to make their economic uh, business expand. The danger is that they then leave themselves vulnerable to accident, to uh, all of the you know, difficult Arctic conditions that we know about. When you talk about prevention, the, the first rule of prevention, or the easiest way to prevent, might be to, to limit how far they push that envelope. Do, do, you think, do you worry that the envelope is being pushed too far? Um. You know, I think for, from a Coast Guard perspective, we don't get to control, um, you know, who pursues what business interests. So we're really focused on... But you ought to have an advisory role, shouldn't you? Uh, we do have advisory roles on a number of different things, and we certainly participate in the, Ar the Arctic Council and some of the work groups in the Arctic Council. Um, so we're very much focused on um, preparing for what's happened today and prepare what's happened for tomorrow. So we look at things we're focused in on really has to do with building out our capability um, to operate in the Arctic. I mentioned we're building a new icebreaker. Uh, we're built, talking about strength, and I talked about strength in the rules-based order, building partnerships with various folks, learning from other folks uh, to operate in a very unique environment. Various folks have different levels of expertise, work very hard to work with uh, our partners in many other countries and learn from each other. Um, and we're also focused on that kind of innovation. But I, are As you we concerned look at about the, 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 the expansion of shipping in, in, in the far north? I mean, we've heard the Faroe Islands depends or, or mm -hmm. is looking to an ever sort of more connected uh, Arctic in terms of shipping operations. But I wonder if you worry it may be outstripping the ability of those like yourself to, to safeguard it. Yeah, I think that um, in, our own, in our own Arctic waters, we're very much focused in on that. So in the U.S. Arctic waters, for example, uh, what we started doing is in the uh, summer months, from July through October, in the far north Alaska, 
We started putting a seasonal presence there that includes helicopters, mm. um, includes some deployable capability, includes some mobile teams to kind of deal with the things we're seeing so we're able to respond to folks. But we're also working with the local communities um, on their resiliency and taking some of our expertise. We have a lot of expertise in maritime safety. So some of the things you'll see is that uh, we talked a little bit about fishing this morning. Uh, it's not just um, as fish are moving, it, it forces people to maybe to push out a little bit further. So working with them on the safety aspects of that, so if they have to go out further, um, they're in a safe position to do so. Yeah. Well, it's an important role. I, I, I want to move away from fishing and, and shipping to, to energy. And Gary, you, you were very interesting and, and pretty blunt, really, in, in your uh, perspective on, on the need to be realistic about the balance between expanding economic activity, business operations, and the need to conserve and protect. But I suppose one question for business, particularly the energy business in the far north, is who's really benefiting? How do you persuade people in the far north that increased, expanded exploration of fossil fuels, for example, is actually in their interest for the people who already live in the far north? You have to have a footprint onshore to make activity offshore. You have to have you have to create jobs in the Arctic if you are going to have activity in the Arctic. But are those jobs usually for local people or are they for technicians and outsiders who come in and regard it as just a transient work experience? It has no value if you only use it to transport people from the hubs in Europe to the Arctic to work for two weeks and go out again. You see that if people stay over time, they also settle. They meet, guys meet girls, they make babies, they make houses, they make families, they make societies. So if we go have activity in the Arctic, whether it's energy, minerals, or whatever it is, it, you have to create societies. And that's the only way to do it, to make the Arctic more powerful and more livable. Mm. So, so, and, and we do have to remember that in a realistic manner, it's not like we're going to quit using natural gas tomorrow or the day after or the day after that. We're going to use the natural gas from the Arctic as a security measure, as an energy measure in the foreseeable future in Europe and in the Western world. And we can't end up in a situation where we should try to solve the climate challenges or other challenges made in the rest of the world in the Arctic because it shows most in the Arctic. Well, indeed, it shows most it shows in the Arctic, most, but which would make one think that the Arctic nations would be intensely aware of the need to leave a lot of this fossil, potential fossil fuel in the ground. Because if we are truly to decarbonize, globally decarbonize by 2050, a lot of this stuff needs to stay in the ground. Yeah, a lot of it needs to stay in the ground, but does it need to stay in the ground in the Arctic? Well, <laughs> that, 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 yeah, but, but that is a question because if you're going to to explore and and exploit uh, resources in Kuwait and in Qatar and in Russia and in Saudi but stop in the Arctic, that doesn't make sense for me. Well, it doesn't make sense for you because you represent the energy industry in Norway. I get that. But, I mean, it does make sense to an outsider who doesn't have a dog in the fight in terms of the geographical location that, frankly, producing uh, fossil fuels, oil and gas in some of the countries you mentioned, like Kuwait, Saudi, even parts of Russia that aren't in the Arctic, it, it, it is cheaper. I mean, it's just much, much cheaper to produce oil and gas in most of the Middle East than it is in the far north. No, but that, that's, not, that's not quite true, because making shale gas in the U.S. or shale oil in the U.S. isn't cheaper than exploiting the Yuan Kosberg in north of here. That's not true. So it isn't true because there isn't just one... Uh, calculation that's true, it's different calculation for different fields. And I agree, we have to leave a lot of fossil fuels in the ground, a lot of coal, a lot of oil, but we still need the natural gas for a lot of decades to come. And where that should come from, that's a discussion uh, yeah, well, from the economy. It, 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 this is fascinating. And Haider, I'm going to bring you in because you, you take an overview, I guess, in the Arctic Economic Council. You obviously take an interest in all these sectors. Fossil fuel extraction, tourism, shipping, fisheries, of course. Um, 
What's your ambition, your aspiration for the future direct direction of Arctic economic expansion? Would you like to see uh, fossil fuels play less uh, of a role and, and some of the other things I mentioned, including tourism, to be boosted in terms of the proportion of, of GDP growth in the Arctic that comes from them? Yeah, it's a good question. But first, I would like to sort of uh, explain a little bit that it's not just the pharaohs that are growing with their population <laughs> in the Arctic. <laughs> okay. You know, I Icelanders have gone from being 100,000 in 1900 to 200 in 1980 to 300 in 2000 to 360 now. So, and it's usually because. Uh, we like to reproduce, really, because so it's not just immigration. We do that too, but they move away. Yeah, we, we seem to. Are you be able saying to keep Iceland is better at sex? I'm not quite yeah. sure what you're yeah. saying. Well, there's mating season usually in the beginning of <laughs> August, so it's open for all. You have time if the time stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this yeah, this yeah. conversation could go way off topic. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Back, and it might be very interesting, but yeah. it probably wouldn't. But back to the yeah. economic growth, you know, because it's about the challenge going forward is how do we do more with less? How are we able to be more efficient going forward? And if we look towards, towards Asia, where their population is growing, or at least their income of the population is growing tremendously, there was a billion people added to the middle income segment in Asia, in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, just in the last 10 years. There's going to be 2 billion more people. Where are they going to get their energy from? Today, they're building over 100 new coal-powered power plants every year. So if we could substitute the coal with clean LNG, much, much cleaner, we're actually doing the world some good. But what also so you're in his corner. Well, there, these are not corners, mm -hmm. actually. This is about people living in the Arctic and how they can sort of thrive. And if we look towards sort of unintended consequences. Yeah, but the, the, I mean, just you, the language you use, the notion of this truly clean fossil fuel, to many people, that, that, that's a, a sort of contradiction in terms. Yeah, but then we can look at stranded renewable energy. We can look at hydropower. Yes, I'm very interested because, to hear about yes. these other. Because I asked you if you want to move away, you know, get the Arctic to. Mm -hmm to really focus on investing in economic growth that is not fossil fuel-based. And, and that's based. where I'm coming to, mm. because what is the icebreaker? Usually you need these big, big projects to break the ice, to build the harbor, to build the airport. Once you have that in place, you need the power grid. Once you have that in place, you can start tapping these renewable mm. Uh, sort of opportunities around. Uh, so it ho goes hand in hand. One does not work against the each other or the other. It actually works together. So if we look at sort of the business and how it can and, and the economies and the societies, how they can develop in the Arctic, it's by, as I say, doing more with less. If we yes. are competitive internationally, if we can sort of somehow increase the efficiency internationally, we should be welcome to the stage. What kind of population growth do you envisage as part of the economic expansion of the Arctic? You know, if we say roughly 4 million people live in the Arctic, <coughs> excuse me, today, um, you know, if you use your imagination and look 10 years ahead and 20 years ahead, we, we, are we talking about a serious population expansion? That is, lots of, never mind how good you are at sex, lots of outsiders, <laughs> uh, non-Arctic people coming to make a life in the Arctic. Absolutely. Just if I look towards to the west of Iceland, to Greenland, which is six times the size of Norway, mm. 20, 21 or 22 times the size of Iceland, with a population of 50,000 people. When they're building the necessary infrastructure now, which are three new airports, a new harbor, etc., it's going to open up the economy completely. It's been stranded opportunities, but, but, but coming yeah, into... So what's going to happen there mm -hmm. is something that I think the Greenland people also need to discuss. Well, they are discussing it, and some of them are very, very worried yes, about it. You know, the more the, the, the big corporations, the mining companies look at opening plants in Greenland and, and talk about bringing in thousands of workers, because yes. whatever Gear says, you know, a lot of these workers, particularly in a very low population place like Greenland, will have to come from outside. You fundamentally change the culture, Absolutely. and business has to think about that. And that's what we are thinking about. So, uh, 10 years ago, I went to Greenland to have a discussion at Parliament and radio and TV about the new big Alcoa plant that was going to be built mm. there. And it was going to be built on an island where they had 2,500 people, local people. But you were going to have 1,000 new people coming in. Yeah. And what would be the sort of impacts of society? They hadn't really gone through it, but we are, you know, 
areas which have seen this happen before. We have, I think, a responsibility to tell others what our true experiences are. And there needs to be social acceptance. There needs to be social sort of participation. So that's why the Arctic Economic Council now has something called the Arctic Investment Protocol, which are six points, three of whom are completely directed at the local population. They need, there needs to be a transfer of knowledge, new jobs, diversification, etc. They need to have the final say on how things develop. And uh, uh, their own businesses, existing businesses, they need to survive alongside. Yeah, it's very interesting. Venka, I want to bring you in, because I think you spent time in New York working with the people running this global compact on sustainable mm. development. Does it sound to you like a... It, I'm not sort of trying to target Alcoa in particular, but a, a huge global conglomerate that wants to go into Greenland and, you know, import a thousand workers into a community that only has 2,000 people in the first place. Does that sound to you like a sustainable business proposition? Uh, well, first of all, I also think, you know, bringing the energy discussion is very uh, much needed and we need to have these kinds of discussions uh, everywhere more often because there, there may be competing interests even in, in the industries between energy, seafood, uh, having absolutely. these discussions in Global Compact. Uh, and that's the intention of, of working cross sectors. Uh, to see where there are competing interests, where there are uh, similar interests, so that you can actually have, take a holistic perspective in developing new areas, such as the Arctic, mm. if that's the case. Um, and of course, uh, an increased population will need more food, it will need more energy, it will need more transport, so it will have a local impact. Um, but perhaps uh, we know that the largest impact is, of course, on the Arctic. It's not uh, local at the moment, it will continue to be. Uh, from everywhere else in the world, it will be climate change impacts. That's true. Actually, you've just raised a thought in my head that interests me about whether all of you, with your big ambitions, uh, actually, I'm sort of not quite so much you, Admiral, because you're a Coast Guard rather than <laughs> really focused on the business environment, but, but many of you on this panel, with your <coughs> big ambitions to expand economic enterprise in the Arctic, to, and, and that will you know, bring more people, more uh, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Are you aware that outside the Arctic, many people sort of feel what they want from the Arctic is the, is the preservation of the pristine, beautiful, wild, last sort of resort of wildness and unspoilt sort of beauty in, on the planet. And, and I'm just thinking of corporations like Nike, for example, situated a long way from uh, the Arctic itself, who've decreed that however much the ice melts and however much the northern sea route can become a, 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 a viable shipping lane for their production to be sent to Asia or whatever, they're never going to use it. You know, they're using it as a sort of symbolic statement of saying, we, as a giant corporation in the world today, regard it as our responsibility to say no to this form of Arctic development. Hmm. That mindset could affect Absolutely. your ability to grow. Absolutely, and I think it's uh, very alarming because especially these are companies which have been criticized for lack of sort of social responsibility in where they produce their goods, how mm. they're produced, etc. So to me, it's more of virtue signaling than anything else. You think it's grandstanding and, it, and, and, and it's greenwashing. And it's far easier to take a social responsibility somewhere else than in your own mm. factory. Mm. Right, but, but what I'm saying is the Arctic does attract grandstanding in that way because so many of us from outside look at it and think the last thing we want to see is more factories, more... But I think it's also prejudice because people don't pay enough recognition to the people that actually have lived for millennia in these harsh conditions and survived and are proud of their sort of achievements and their cultures and they want to keep living there. And then there are people that perhaps have not done as well at home coming in and saying, well, now you should stop. We just want to sort of preserve this. Everyone out, yeah, everyone well, that, look at it. But that's complicated because that only works as an argument if you truly have the indigenous peoples and others on board with the economic expansion. Yeah, well, and absolutely. oftentimes they're not because they feel they're not going to be the beneficiaries of it. Very true. But like, for instance, Greenland that I was referring to earlier, there's a, the largest national park on the planet there and has been there for a long, long time. It's visited by less than 100 people every year. And uh, it's just there, people say they want more of this, but then they don't even bother to go there. And at the same time, the same people who want to preserve it is depending on another industry, which is tourism industry, to go there to see it mm. preserved. Yes. Well, <laughs> the tourism is an interesting case. And uh, you, mm. you guys in the Faroe Islands have really expanded your tourism industry. 
but are you doing it in a way that you think is sustainable and works for local people? Yes, I think it's, we are doing quite good. I have to make a note to this uh, discussion ab about uh, green energy uh, because I think it's very important that uh, the Arctic countries are showing the way because we are seeing uh, the climate change in the Arctic mm. area. And therefore, it's very important that we are doing something uh, with, the, with the problem. So do you have a bit of a difficulty listening to, to Geir? I can't and imagine, not. because the Faroes have been exploring for oil for 25 yes, years. Yes, we have. But we are showing the way now, because in 2030, we want to be 100% renewable with energy. And for a small community as the Faroe Island, we can be a test laboratory for new technology, even though it's tidal power, wind power, and wave power, or what are we discussing? So you can show new opportunities and new businesses within the, the energy sector. So I think it's very important that we are showing the way. Uh, when we're speaking of tourism, um, it is very uh, crucial that we have a sustainable growth within the tourism. In the Faroe Island, we have uh, a large focus on uh, having uh, arrangements, uh, business events, and, and other meetings in the Faroe Island because these uh, visitors are spending more money than uh, normal guests. So we can see that the, the tourists uh, also are asking for sustainable uh, solutions when they come uh, and visit Faroe Island, for example. So I think we have uh, got the How right many line. tourists a year are you getting now? Around 110,000 right. a year. And, and so it's a 10% uh, growth every year. Right, and I, I never teased out of you what, what is actually the population of Faroe Island right now. 52,000 people. Right, okay, okay. Mm. Good. Uh, it's time, if I may, I'm just going to call a pause to the panel discussion for just a moment because we've got one um, speaker who's just going to give us some insight from his perspective. And, and this is very much about the potential, the geographical, sort of topographical potential that lies in the vast Arctic region. So uh, we're going to get a presentation now, a brief presentation from, from Noel Tengshager, who's from the Norwegian Mapping Authority, from the Hydrographic Service. So over to you. Thank you. Bear with me. Can you all take three very deep breaths? Come on. <laughs> In. Out. In. Out. Oh, I now. So, so much better already. <laughs> Out of those three breaths, <laughs> two of them had oxygen generated in the ocean. That's how important our oceans and our coastline is. And if you're worried about the carbon monoxide you exhaled when you were doing this, imagine the fact that one acre of kelp forest retains the same CO2 as 40 acres of rainforest. That's how important the rain, uh, no, sorry, uh, the ocean and the coastline is. Just to put a perspective on it, yeah? Oh, sorry, I'm a bit crack. I'll bring you a gift today. It's a gift that we'll keep giving for generations. It's marine base maps in coastal Norway. It's a partnership between Norwegian Mapping Authority, Geological Survey of Norway, and the Institute of Marine Research. It doesn't really sound very sexy, but it forms the basis of a sustainable blue economy. So listen up, yeah? We'll harvest the data once, for all the uses and the use cases. Bathymetry, water column, sea level, geology, biology, chemistry, statistics, time dimension, etc. In three pilot areas in Norway. We'll make this data available for free through the national spatial data infrastructure for everyone, for every need. Not only the scientific data, but also models and the finished analysis and expert interpretations of the data. This will remove uncertainty, greatly reduce conflicts in areas, and will enable you to identify optimal areas where it's possible, uh, or areas where it's possible to coexist with potential conflicts. If we don't do this, we risk developing our coastline blindfolded, with all the negative consequences this can lead to. An independent consultancy company did a socio-economic study in three small areas along the coastline. We're talking about 1,200 square kilometers, which is approximately 1% of the proposed area in a national program. Now, the study shows the potential of creating 62 new permanent jobs 
in these three areas. Mm. The study predicts a return on investment of 1 to 2.5 on just one indicator. That's a 3% increase in existing aquaculture facilities with a very conservative estimate of 5 kroner profit per salmon. Five municipalities are already using um, marine base maps and on average they save one man year less on uh, issues related to their cases of coastal zone. And the municipalities have already started to attract new businesses ranging from marine research to aquaculture, 3D visualization and engineering. We're now commissioning a new nationwide socioeconomic study in looking into all indicators, not just one. Norway has the second longest coastline in the world, over 100,000 kilometers long. Now imagine the impact of a national program, the new jobs, and the new businesses. Imagine also for the municipalities, the tax revenues from this. Imagine local communities getting permanent boosts where we can turn the trend of people moving away into cities for jobs and rather creating them along the coastline. But we have a challenge. Marine base maps in the pilot ray regions are showing good results and are good investments in new jobs and businesses. But even with results like this, we have a challenge at the national level where the marine base maps are not established. Data is often collected for specific use in tiny areas at high transaction costs with no common specification, thus preventing reuse of the data and little to no return of investment. How can we best coordinate all efforts to establish marine base maps at the national level, harvesting data once for all possible uses for the benefit of all and to build smart and sustainable societies. I mentioned at the start of my outline that this is a gift for generations to come if Norway succeeds in this venture. We could have the gift for the global community as methodology, standardization, best practices, indicators and more will be useful globally. And to quote the UN, leaving no one behind. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> so, there you go. Uh, the theme of um, the power of knowledge that has run through Arctic Frontiers 2020, perhaps given a, a, a great specific example there with this notion and, and the, the practice already in the three case studies of, of coastal mapping enhancing the way in which business can best exploit opportunities around Norway's coast and obviously the challenge to roll that out nationally. But it does also then raise the question of whether you want more and more of Norway's coast to be given over to business activity. And I feel actually at this point, with that thought in mind, perhaps it's time to open up again as we've got a bit of time left to get questions from you guys for our panel now. So, you know, the theme is how far can business expand? How should it be done? What represents sustainability? Who benefits? Who are the real stakeholders in all of this? Let's get some questions from the floor. We've got a couple of arms up here, so we'll get to you two. Um, if we get the mic first to the gentleman nearer the front, there we go. Let's get your question. Hi, my name is uh, Gregor Mears. I'm a freelance journalist and a graduate student at the University of Colorado. There's been a lot of talk about including young people in decision making, but I find it kind of ironic, and please don't take offense to this, that <laughs> a lot of the main panel discussions have not involved right. younger people. There have been some side events and things uh, like that where folks have been I'm not offended, and with. I think it's an observation that's entirely fair, yeah. And so I'm curious, specifically with the industry professionals up here, if they could elaborate or perhaps give context for how young people are being involved in the decision making process um, when it relates to kind of your business activities? Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of young people, both in the decision making inside the business, but also in society at large. And there are, of course, different opinions towards generations. A couple of years ago, you had my daughter on stage here. Yeah. And, and 
me and her, we don't agree on everything, but I would be really shocked if we were agreeing on everything. But that doesn't mean that I'm out of a voice or her, her is out of a voice. It means we also have to have a continuous society discussion between the generation, between the genders, between the business, between the politicians. And that is how we end up through the whole discussion to the best models, not excluding someone or including just someone. We have a total society discussion. And in Norway, I work for a trade organization. We discuss with business and we discuss with governments all the time to find the best solutions to build the next step of the Norwegian society, both onshore and offshore. Yeah, I mean, uh, making a sort of gesture of, of you know, giving a role to young people's voices is one thing, but actually giving them some weight and uh, <laughs> responding to what they're saying is perhaps a little different. I I'm just wondering whether the, 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 there is a way, particularly in this sort of era of Greta Thunberg and, and you know, a bunch of other very important young activists of of, of formalizing and, and giving real weight to, to the voice of yeah. the younger generation. Yeah. Like, for instance, at the Arctic Economic Council, what we did was we produced with the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in Denmark, we produced a special report on funding on venture capital ideas, on, on startups, on how to innovate in the Arctic, how we can better sort of uh, formulate the relationship amongst the various institutions, sort of on a pan Arctic level, uh, go more sort of into collaboration with the universities to especially reach out because what we see with innovation and with knowledge of course that it grows with any every generation and uh, so when we look at the Arctic as it is today we have some established industries those industries are sort of at their peak somehow or we might say and they're sort of delivering a lot of returns we take those returns and then we invest in the next new thing but the people coming with a new new thing are usually not the older generation the generation which has been immersed in the current sort of industry so there is a natural renewable sort of situation here so I, I for business as such I, I think this is extremely important and I think that discussion and the planning is, is underway. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask you, in the Faroe Islands, how do you give uh, a, a genuinely important place and voice to young people? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good question. And from my point of view, uh, as a politician, it is very important to listen to the young people because they know uh, how they want the, the society to go in the future. Uh, they have a lot of ideas. And as I mentioned in my uh, introduction, we have this uh, house of innovation in Toshan where a lot of young people can create uh, their own uh, company and their own uh, with their own ideas. So it's very important to involve the young people in all uh, decision making. Mm. It's, it's very important. All right, I want to crack on because we've got other questions in the audience. So, so I think you had your, oh, you've got the mic already. Well done. Someone handed me a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Lantain. I'm a lecturer at uh, the University of Tromsø and also the editor of the Over the Circle blog. Uh, my question is for uh, Vice Admiral Bushman. You made mention in your presentation of the recent US Coast Guard uh, Arctic policy paper. Uh, this paper was notable because it specifically singled out uh, Russia and China for negative activities in the region. Uh, between that as well as the fact that the uh, current administration appears to be also taking exception to uh, Canadian and Russian sovereignty in certain Arctic sea routes, uh, I guess my question is, uh, with those you know, particular policies and assertions, do you see a contradiction between that and American policies towards expanding cooperation in the Arctic? Thank you. Um, no, I think that uh, as it relates to sea routes, uh, in the U.S. has a different position on certain claims that people are made. Um, there's a mechanism to adjudicate those, those claims. Um, and I also say, I think if you look at the U.S. Coast Guard, I don't think there's a contradiction there. Um, I think we have a strong history of partnerships um, within our own country and in the international community. Uh, we do that through, uh, we're a, a participant in the Arctic Council. Um, in 2015, we were leaders in creating an Arctic Coast Guard Forum, which is really a way to, uh, what we like to call operationalize somewhere between diplomacy and operations. And that, 
produces, and that conducts a couple, it's already conducted two live exercises in a number of different uh, countries. Uh, Finland hosted the most recent one, we participated in that. So I think if you look at the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, we have just a, a, a long history, um, certainly in the Arctic today, of, of uh, work re working with uh, many other countries. Um, and while we may have some differences of opinions, I think we do it in a respectful manner. So. Okay. Um, would anybody else like to ask a question? Because we've got uh, space, a little window for one more. Ma'am, yes, go for it. We'll get you the microphone. Hi, my name is Patty Bruns, and um, I had the pleasure of being the Executive Secretary for the Emergency Prevention, Preparedness, and Response Working Group for a number of years. And I'd like to ask a question following up on Viking Sky. We know that um, increase of tourism, uh, oil exploration, nuclear floating power plants is increasing in the Arctic, and Viking Sky really called attention to how difficult it is to respond. That ship was in sight of shore. And it required massive amounts of resources. Are we actually able to respond to a sinking cruise ship in the high Arctic? Well, I love a direct question, and there you go. That's a direct question. Because that's to me. I guess it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's certainly something we're concerned about. So, so I will tell you that I'm not just concerned about a cruise ship in the Arctic. I'm concerned about a cruise ship anywhere. I mean, some of our large mm. cruise ships have maybe eight or, or, or 8,000 or, or more people when you look at the crew and the passengers on total of them. So in the United States, what I can tell you is, and I have experience with what we call mass casualties, right? How you respond to those things. And they're difficult um, in any scenario, um, even when you're close to shore, when you're closer to um, the United States where you have a lot of resources. So uh, when you have that kind of risk, we look at uh, how do you kind of manage that risk? So we are required to have plans for that type of thing. Cruise ships are required to have plans for those types of things. Uh, we exercise those plans and so on and so forth. When you take that up to that many people um, in a very remote area, certainly it's, um, it, it does give cause for concern of what happens or something like that. And but I mean, it is fundamentally different happening off it, the coast of Florida from happening off the you know, remote coast in the far north. It, it absolutely is. So that's one of the reasons we're looking at building out our capacity to respond to something like that. We're working with whole other nations to uh, kind of innovate as you look at how we look at these things. We learn from each other and so on and so forth. And I think I talked about earlier about the prevention. What are the mechanisms you need to kind of prevent accidents and to prevent these kind of things from happening? But uh, am I concerned about uh, those types of incidences in, in these environments? The answer is absolutely yes. So. All right. Well, listen, it's been fascinating. I think what, what we can take away from this is that um, in various different sectors, from sort of tourism to uh, extraction of commodities to fisheries, of course, and many other high-tech industries that the pharaohs and other uh, North nations are pursuing, there is going to be an expansion of business activity in the Arctic. And the question is, and we'll monitor it obviously year by year, how it is done and whether this word, this magic word that we wheel out all the time, sustainability, whether it really is lived up to in the development of the Arctic and its economy. But for now, uh, it is lunchtime. I think we only have one hour, not 90 minutes. We have one hour for lunch before we get back for the, the, the closing session this afternoon. So I wish you bon appetit, but before that, a big thanks, of course, to our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks. <laughs>